this is what happened in Jincheon on January 30th, 10 days after the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in South Korea. The local residents of Asan and Jincheon, uh, where the South Korean government planned to quarantine evacuees from Wuhan, uh, the epicenter of the new coronavirus outbreak in China, uh, held protest rallies and uh, blocked rows with tractors voicing concerns about their own safety. The situation was tense as South Koreans were getting very nervous about uh, the news of first confirmed cases of COVID-19. Many people, including the main opposition party, uh, were blaming the government for not sealing off the border with China. However, a dramatic turn of events occurred the next day. Residents of Asan and Jincheon announced they would no longer oppose the government decision and only ask for thorough quarantine measures. Soon, the protest banners were replaced by welcome banners, road-blocking tractors by well-wishing SNS messages. Uh, when we face danger, most of us react with a me-first attitude, uh, out of fear and survival instincts. My own safety first before helping others. Well, there's nothing wrong with this. It's only natural. However, we also have empathy and capacity to reason. Because of empathy, we commiserate with the plight of others and want to help them. Because of reason, we realize that our own safety depends on the safety of the whole community and act in socially responsible ways. Uh, drawing on empathy and relying on reason, we may overcome selfishness and develop solidarity. It's easy, however, to succumb to fear and become slaves of our survival instincts, especially when we panic. Then an innocuous me-first attitude can easily morph into a baleful, me-only attitude. Residents of Chincheon and Asan and the people of South Korea more broadly were uh, tending toward this ominous path. Somehow, between January 30th and 31st, something happened so that they were able to resist this evil temptation and retrieve the better angel of our nature. So, what changed? I'll come back to this at the end of my talk. Uh, the spirit of solidarity has largely prevailed in South Korean responses uh, to COVID-19. Uh, after uh, the infamous Shincheonji sect-related outbreak in February, uh, turned the city of Daegu into the second major epidemic uh, after Wuhan, uh, there were calls for closing of the city. Lots of people were blaming people uh, in Daegu. As the virus raged and the uh, patients overwhelmed the local hospitals, Korean people once again put solidarity ahead of fear and selfishness. A lot of medical professionals and other volunteers ventured to lend a helping hand at the front line of the pandemic. Lots of personal protective equipment and other goods poured into the city, even ambulances like these. And hospitals in faraway regions accepted virus-stricken patients from Daegu. Uh, the explosive outbreak in Daegu was tamed within a month without a lockdown. And the spread of COVID-19 outside the city remained under control uh, without ever sealing off the city. One more example of solidarity prevailing concerns the policy toward undocumented immigrants which I recommended to the government as a member of the Pandemic Response Advisory Committee. Uh, Prime Minister Chung se yun laid out this policy in late April as follows, and I quote, please strengthen quarantine efforts in areas uh, that have high concentrations of foreigners and make sure they receive face masks and other treatments at uh, public health facilities without worrying about their immigration status. I believe this triumph of solidarity over the me-only attitude has been central to the South Korean success in dealing with COVID-19 
and should be a key element in the global response to the pandemic. So this leads all of us here today to an important question. Why is solidarity an essential element of an effective COVID-19 response? Uh, the primary goal of a pandemic response is flattening the curve. We have all heard so much about this concept and we all know what it is, right? Yes? No? <laughs> flattening the curve means inhibiting new infections to keep the number of cases, confirmed cases at any moment below the level the healthcare system can handle. Now, to flatten the curve, uh, we can employ three lines of defense against the spread of the virus, just like a typical formation in football. Uh, the first line, defense, voluntary uh, actions at, uh, uh, on an individual level. Second, the social imposition of these individual level uh, defenses. And thirdly, a testing and tracing strategy. So uh, what can individuals do? What should individuals do? We all know this, three W's. Wash your hands, wear a mask, watch your distance. Uh, that is, don't get infected and don't infect others by practicing personal hygiene and watching uh, uh, the physical distancing. Uh, this is a relatively low cost response with large benefits. But some people behave carelessly, often because they think the risk of infection is low. And therefore, uh, the benefit of reducing the probability of infection is not worth the bother. But this is a selfish calculation, not taking into uh, the effect of their behavior in terms of infecting others. This is what's called the externality problem in economic theory. Self-regarding individuals ignore the effects of their behavior on others to the detriment of social welfare. Solidarity is a cure for this problem. It leads people to internalize the externalities and behave responsibly, not only to protect themselves, but to protect others. Uh, another important reason for people failing to observe the three Ws is poverty and other economic imperatives, including uh, the so-called essential workers. Obviously, we need solidarity to help these people protect themselves and others. The second line of defense is socially imposing the individual level defenses. This can be highly effective, but mandating mask wearing is controversial, as we are uh, seeing in the United States and elsewhere. And socially imposing physical distancing, that is uh, 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 social distancing, uh, such as border closures and lockdowns, can be extremely costly, often unbearably so for poor people. Uh, unless we help them, they may undermine social distancing regimes. Again, solidarity is crucial. The third line of defense is testing and tracing strategy. Here, an essential ingredient of success is people's cooperation. In terms of getting tested when they develop suspected symptoms and telling the truth about their contacts when they test positive. Hiding and lying are the worst enemy of this strategy. This is why we need the a solidarity-based approach regarding the undocumented immigrants and other marginalized groups. They may be easily tempted to hide and lie unless they feel safe. Uh, to appreciate the importance of solidarity in a pandemic response, let us imagine now, what would have happened had the residents of Asan and Chinchon continued their resistance to housing the evacuees and the political conflicts surrounding this issue had deepened. A toxic politicization of the pandemic response policy and a milieu of blaming the victims would have followed. A flattening the curve in Daegu would have been much more difficult than drawn out. Uh, the much acclaimed strategy of testing and tracing would have been much less effective 
because of hiding and lying by those who feel insecure for whatever reasons. In fact, the me only attitude and the lack of solidarity have hindered the pandemic responses around the world. An obvious example is reckless parties like this uh, that breed community infections. Also, it is no secret that marginalized and poor people around the world uh, bear the brunt of the pandemic, often thwarting the quarantine efforts and thereby exacerbating the pandemic. Somali refugees in Sweden, Venezuelan refugees in Colombia, migrant workers, Singapore, India, the list goes on and on. A particularly poignant example of how the lack of solidarity exacerbates the pandemic comes from the detention and deportation policy of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, of the US government. An investigation by the New York Times and the Marshall Project revealed how the ICE agency turned into a worldwide spreader of the virus with unsafe conditions and scattershot testing in its detention centers and forced deportation of the virus-infected patients to their countries of origin. Okay, we have looked at why solidarity is, an import, is important in flattening the curve. But this is not the end of the story. To put a complete end to the pandemic, uh, we need research and development to find effective cures and vaccines. Scientific knowledge is what we call a public good in economic theory. And as such, the best strategy to make progress on this front is the most public approach imaginable. That is, global cooperation with all the experts around the world pitching in and sharing knowledge and information. Sounds too idealistic? In fact, this is how we have been producing the flu vaccine over the past 50 years, and how the global scientific community has been responding to COVID-19 so far, following the laudable tradition of open science. We must keep watch, however, lest the me-only attitude destroys the solidarity of the scientific community. Commercial pharmaceutical companies have been profiting from privatizing and locking up knowledge commons. And some politicians have been taking a my nation first, or even my nation only approach to developing and distributing the potential vaccines and pharmaceutical treatment. The virus pays no attention to political borders. COVID-19 reminds us that we're all connected, no matter where we live, what we believe, what we have, or what we look like. It's self-evident that a global pandemic calls for global cooperation. Yet today, global cooperation is conspicuous by its absence. In fact, intergovernmental conflicts over the pandemic response have done enormous harm causing unnecessary losses and preventable deaths. The lack of leadership and solidarity is an even greater threat than the virus itself. So, my talk so far can be summed up as follows. Solidarity is an essential part of an effective pandemic response, but there is not enough of it. There is not enough solidarity. So what can you do? What should we do? This brings me back to the story of Chinchon and Asan. What happened between January 30th and 31st? What happened to turn the situation around? Why did the me only attitude stop spreading and yield to the feelings of solidarity? Well, yes, there were assurances and persuasions by the government officials for sure. But they were probably not decisive, given that the residents were so angry about the unilateral decision by the government. On the other hand, the tide was turning on social networking sites, where more and more people came to coalesce around the opinion that criticizing the government was one thing, and rejecting the evacuees was another. The evacuees didn't do anything wrong. 
and they are suffering. If we send them away, what will happen to them? We must help them, said the voice of reason and empathy within us. More and more people began to think this way. In this process, an initiative known as the We Are Asan campaign seemed to have played an important role. A resident of Asan, a certain um, posted the following Facebook message on the 30th. I'm starting a relay to show that many people in Asan actually welcome our brothers and sisters from Wuhan, who must have trembled with fear. Let us welcome them warmly. Soon, it was followed by a lot of messages and photos in support like these, not only in Asan, but Jincheon as well. On the night of January 30th, the situation was tense and fluid. It was possible that the me-only attitude would continue to strengthen and uh, overpower solidarity. Luckily for all of us, the public opinion turned around. We never know exactly how the turnaround came about. It's clear, however, that it would not have happened uh, if no one did anything to change the time. Perhaps the We Are Asan campaign produced a butterfly effect and proved decisive. Perhaps it was something else that was decisive. More likely, a lot of small actions by many individuals helped tip the balance in favor of solidarity. The moral of this story is simple. We must do what we can to help solidarity win its battle over the me only attitude. No matter how small and insignificant it may seem, our actions may end up making a big difference. If more of us act, the better the odds for solidarity will be. So look around. See if there are things that you can do to help the side of solidarity. I'm sure there are many things you can do. I challenge you to do one thing, one project of yours for solidarity's sake. This is the spirit of KDI School, the host of this event. We are a small institution, but we have a big dream, a world in which everyone on earth cooperates to flatten the curve, to counter the pandemic, and to overcome other global problems together in solidarity. Thank you.